Hello and welcome to Second Watch, your direct line to the second mass. I'm your host, Will Wheaton. Tonight's episode was one of the most intensely emotional hours we've spent with Falling Skies, but that doesn't mean it didn't have its share of action. Joining me to talk about it in studio are Maxim Knight and executive producer Greg Beeman. All right, Maxim, uh, you guys all went out tonight uh, to, uh, to go and try to track down Anne and Lexi, and um, you come across a dead body that we all think is, is Anne. Right? right, but then when we find out that she is uh, not Anne, um, uh, Matt seems unbelievably relieved. Uh, what do you think is going on? Like, what is Matt's uh, sort of emotional relationship to that person who's dead out there? Well, you know, a couple episodes ago, I uh, had emotional moments with Anne, mm -hmm. so you know, we're we're very together now. You know, we're we've bonded. And seeing this dead woman and knowing that Anne is still out there and that she's okay, uh, you know, of course that's a relief. But then also I have this connection to this woman because now, you know, with Anne, I've kind of found a mother figure because I did lose my mom and that was very traumatic. And now I'm just wondering, like, you know, this horrible thing that happened to the woman, yeah. it's it's very sad. I have to tell you, I, 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 I was, like, yelling at the TV, like, there is no way that Weaver says, let's stop this search to bury this, this body. But that scene when you guys are around her, she becomes everyone's mother for a minute. And she becomes this, this uh, sort of oracle that everyone can project uh, their, their sadness and, and, and onto. It, was, it paid it off so, so well. In this episode, you know, the director, Sergio Gazan, had really felt in prepping the script that Matt's character was the heart of the episode. Not so much as an active character, but as an observer and as taking in all the emotions that were going on. And he, right. he we shot a lot of close-ups of Maxim to like kind of pivot the story around. Yeah, I felt that. I felt Matt becomes the audience's uh, like, like place. You know, there's, so you're sort of like the point of view character. Are you aware of that or are you just, you're just doing your thing? I didn't even know about that until now. But, uh, <laughs> awesome. but you know, like, I mean, yeah, Matt is a, I think he's a relatable character. Because, yeah. you know, he's, he still has a little bit of an innocence with him. You know, as producers and writers, uh, we always have to keep up, up in the ante for all of our characters. Yeah. And, and sometimes, like in Maxim's case, we, we don't know, you know, okay, we're going to take this story in a new direction. Last year, it was really um, Connor Jessup, who, like, suddenly had a whole new direction that he had to go in. And so we just kind of hope that they're going to step up. And then, yeah, you're not party to the behind the scenes where we go, like, Maxim's awesome. Did you see the dailies? Like, he did exactly what we were really hoping he could do. That's great. <laughs> like, on behalf of, like, I feel like, you know, we're sort of in the child actor club, right? <laughs> so uh, that's great. I'm bringing that up at the next meeting. Uh, <laughs> Tom and Pope survive a plane crash together. Tom rescues Pope from the burning wreckage of the plane. Out in the woods, they start to open up. We think, oh, maybe there's a little bit of a, a friendship happening. They're going to go through a trial in the wild. And then Tom just beats the crap out of him. Um, are these guys ever going to become friends? I think it's a long shot. Yeah? Uh, they're kind of like cats and dogs, you know? The, they, I think there's a respect that each has for the other because yeah. of their ability to survive. But uh, I don't think they're ever going to really work it out. It seems like Tom Mason and Pope um, find out, like, over and over again, this happened a lot last season, too, that they're essentially two sides of the same coin. And I wonder if that makes them just, like, two magnets that repel each other. Uh, they're at an impasse with friendships. But then when they're out there in the woods and, and it looks like this is it, they're really in trouble, it seems to sort of like that adversity brings out the best in them. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think what you said... You know, I don't know what Noah or Colin's process is, but I, my assumption creatively is that the dark side of each is the light side of the other, and I think that, you know, each one of them has a hard time dealing with that. Pope, we learned in this episode, has a hard time dealing with the side of him that wanted to be suburban, and I think, you know, Tom has a hard time really looking at that dark side, which definitely exists in him. I was really surprised. I mean, I, I thought, like, okay, so Pope drops a snake on him, but I did not expect Tom to just fly off the handle like that. There's like, it seems that there's a lot of stress going on with him that's not necessarily about being in the woods. 
Well, it's a big job being the president and having an alien baby, and there's a lot of there's a lot of stress going <laughs> on in going his on. life. Uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Marina. All right, so she comes across as just she's almost robotic in in her just cool, calm efficiency so much that it seems like she may very well have her own agenda aside from doing what's best for Charleston and, and doing what's best for the president. Uh, would you care to maybe fill us in a little bit uh, about what's going on with her and, and what we can sort of expect in the future? Well, you know... I'm even, not asking if she's the mole, but I'm kind of asking if she's the mole. Even we who work on the show behind the scenes, even the writers who are like kind of know where they're going, but as the scripts take on their own life, we discover new things. So my personal opinion is that Marina, played by Gloria Rubin, is only really for the good of Charleston, but she has her own agenda, which is different than Tom's agenda. Right. And she's, you know, we didn't really see that side of her until she got power, but as soon as she has power, she's absolutely willing to use it. And I personally just feel like Gloria just stepped into a, a show and took her own command and, um, and, you know, she does some beautiful work, especially in this episode. It was kind of interesting when she refused to have, uh, to have Will Patton go look for Anne. That was weird. She's being very pragmatic. Yeah. There's a lot going on. There's alien invasions. There's a new race. There's a weapon being built that she's very dubious about. It's not pragmatic to go send a big contingent of, of soldiers out to search for two lost people. Under any other conditions, if it was any other two people, they wouldn't. So right. it's, it's a legitimate position to take. You shot a lot of this episode outside uh, in the Vancouver rain, uh, which anyone who's ever been to Vancouver is very familiar with. Um, and I wonder if you could uh, talk about some of the challenges inherent to shooting like that. I think it was uh, that scene where we found the skitter tracks. We were yeah. out there for a very long time, yeah. and you know, the rain was just so much rain, and in between takes, we would go to the heater and try. But you know, it's right. like, yeah, like. Um, there's a wonderful scene in this episode with Matt and Ben. Um, and I love the relationship that has grown between them this season, and I really hope we get to explore it more as the year goes on. But Matt says to Ben, look, um, I just, like, I'm th thank you for not lying to me. And I get the sense that Ben feels paternal to Matt. And I get the sense that with Tom gone, that, uh, and, and, and how being weird, that uh, Ben is feeling like I gotta be a role model, I gotta step up and, and take care of my little brother. How does it feel for you to be treated more like an adult, more like uh, you're not a little kid, like look, I'm gonna level with you, it's the apocalypse and there's aliens and that's the way it is? Well, I think Ben and I have always kinda had a special bond. Like even before he was taken away by the aliens, we were together because you know, he was kind of a nerd and you know, he, he, he shows me the way into life, basically. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's, I mean, even in real life, Connor and I are, uh, we're like brothers. Yeah, I get that when I'm, when yeah. I'm, when I'm around you guys. Yeah. And I mean, it really, it really comes off. When you, uh, when you were casting these guys, did you feel that chemistry right away? Or, or is it something that's really grown over the, over the course of the year? I would say that it's grown. You know, it's funny, because for Connor, he had a, a weird situation in terms of casting, because he, he was cast originally to be in the pilot. He didn't have any dialogue. He just walked by right. the harness on. And when the series got picked up, we didn't know whether he can act or carry the part that was getting very big. So he had to kind of come back and re-audition along with some other kids to get his part back. That's amazing. Because we knew we could have reshot that one shot if we had to, but he, he did a great audition. He got his part back. and I'm, I'm really glad because he's one of my favorite parts of this series. Mm -hmm. um, we've run out of time, so uh, that's it. Next time, I will be joined by actors Drew Roy, Maxim Knight will be back, Sarah Carter will be here, and executive producer Remy Abushan. In the meantime, you can visit TNTdrama.com to read up on Falling Skies trivia and take a peek behind the scenes. And until we see you next time, Keep the resistance strong.